Joining us now is Jim Scheffler and he is a vegetable extension specialist and you've got some squash trials going on here. Can you kind of tell us what you're doing with these? Right. This is a, a trial that we've been doing to, uh, to look at some alternative methods of, of dealing with some of the insect pests and also the important pollinators that are involved in squash production, that are needed for squash production. So when we talk about pests and squash, a lot of times we're talking about the squash bug. Is that yeah, their primary? That, that's, uh, this was set up to look at a few different pests, but it's turned out to be squash bug is the, is the, pretty much the predominant one. And this, 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 this trial is being done at three different locations in the state, in, in Atoka and also in Shawnee. Okay. And, uh, and at each site, squash bug has been the predominant the predominant insect. Okay, so pest. what are we doing with the row covers? How is that helping or preventing those pests? Okay, what we're doing with these row covers, now at the start of the season, in fact right, right when we planted this squash, we put these row covers on and they were closed up completely, sealed around the bottom. Mm -hmm. You can see a wire there that was used to hold it in place. Uh, the idea with the covers was to keep the, uh, keep the uh, insect pest, which they don't overwinter in the soil, they, they they come and fly into the area. And if you have a cover over your squash plants at that time when the plants are small, those insect pests cannot get to the squash. Okay, so we initially so. get a good plant, solid plant growing under those row covers. Right. But then when they start to bloom, we need pollinators. Right, if you, uh, and we, we, in some cases, we leave the cover on there and just let the plant grow. You get a big, huge plant with lots of flowers, but no fruit. Okay. The reason is because the pollinators could not get to it. So if you're after so, just squash blossoms, that would work. Yeah, right, right. But if we're wanting the fruit, then we obviously need to open it and allow those pollinators to get right, in there. Right, right. So, so, so that leads up to what we're doing here. The, there's some different treatments here that involve different timings of when to remove that cover. Uh, one is just a matter of when do you remove the cover. Another has to do with looking at uh, leaving the cover on opening it up briefly in the morning and then closing it back up. Okay. Again, minimize the amount of time for the insect pests to get to the squash, but allowing time for the pollinators to get in there and do their job. Okay, and so. you've, you've had some that as soon as they started flowering, you took that row cover off and they're not looking so good anymore. <laughs> right, right. If you uh, basically, and, and it probably helps if you do that, but if you remove the cover that early in the season, uh, when the plants are still small, when they begin flowering, then those, in, those squash bugs and other insect pests can start getting to the plants and do the different things they do to, to damage the plants. So why on so, the other ones are you waiting till the morning and just the morning to open them? Okay, the, uh, now, now we really kind of learned some about this as we start with this, but the blossoms on, on the summer squash, it'll be open at daylight. I haven't come out in the night to see what time during the night it opens, uh -huh. I'd, I'd like to do that, but, uh, but they're open at daylight and the pollinators are there. By 10 o'clock in the morning, some days 9.30, some days 10.30, uh, the flowers are pretty much closed up, so no more pollination is occurring so, in, in the squash. So, okay, so you're so limiting your exposure then to those pests. Right, so there's no, there's no reason to leave the pollinators in there after that time since the flowers are closed, and we can close it up or reduce the time. Now, it's not going to eliminate them completely because some will get in there while it's open, but it reduces the, the numbers of the insect pests that get to the plants. And when we talk about pollinators, are, is there one particular insect that's a pollinator for the squash, or are there a lot of different? When we started this trial, and again, we didn't bring any, we didn't bring any pollinating insects in here or anything like that. We mm -hmm. just assumed, you know, we're, and we kind of figured that honeybees would be the main pollinator. As it turned out, uh, again, two years at three different locations, uh, across years and across locations, there were different insects there to pollinate. Uh, it, at some of the sites, it was mainly bumblebees. At others, there were a few, few honeybees. Then, it, and, and here in this site, we had bumblebees here, but we have another insect here, and I don't know if they'll see it on the camera. I think it's called a squash bee. We, I have some collected to get to the entomologist to identify. But this has been, at one of the sites, this was the predominant uh, insect that was in there doing the pollinating. Hmm. So. so this research has been going on for about two years and you're doing a couple of more uh, different uh, experiments up here with the time intervals. When can right. people expect results for this? We, uh, well, we have one commitment to uh, present some of the data at the 1st of October. There'll be an Oklahoma Organic Conference in Oklahoma City on October 6th and 7th. And we have, we, we uh, committed to making a presentation at that at that event so we'll have some of it ready for then but again we have two years and three sites and we have a lot of good information it, it may take it'll take a few months but we'll get it all worked up and I, th I think there'll be some 
really useful information for uh, home gardeners, farmers market growers, organic farmers that, that this, you know, with these insect pests, there are no organic insecticides, approved or insecticides to deal with this, with squash bug mm -hmm. that, that are really effective. So this will be useful information for a lot of different uh, growers, I think. Wonderful. And you've also so, got some research going on on watermelons. Let's go take a look yes. at that. Yes. Okay. So Jim, you have some research going on on the watermelon here, and this is looking at pre-emergent application? Yes, this is looking at a, uh, a herbicide that, uh, that we hope to have approved, uh, hopefully for next year, and, and mainly for commercial watermelon growers. Uh, it, it's a herbicide that uh, basically the grower would, would, would plant the watermelon seed and apply the herbicide on the soil surface, and it will provide control uh, for a lot of different broadleaf weeds, which, you know, a little patch like this, not a big deal, but if you're talking about 100 acres of watermelon, mm -hmm. uh, growers can't afford to have people out there with a hoe, hoeing the weeds. Mm -hmm. And if the weeds take over, they don't harvest any watermelons. Right, right. Now, another thing about it, the uh, again, I don't have that here, but in earlier trials, this can also be used with watermelon that are transplanted, and more and more people are growing, commercial growers are growing seedless watermelon, and you pretty much have to transplant that and they don't have a good herbicide for controlling weeds for the transplanted okay. melons uh, right at this point in time. So it'll be, it'll be useful for those folks too. So why is this pre-emergent an experiment right now? Uh, it's, again, we did, we've done several uh, years work with this herbicide and, and we, we found that it gives good weed control and it's been safe to, uh, to the watermelon crop we used it on. However, we haven't used a lot of different watermelon varieties. So mm -hmm. in this trial, we have actually five, uh, five different uh, watermelon varieties superimposed over the herbicide treatments. So we can, we'll be able to tell if, uh, if maybe one variety is, is susceptible to injury from the herbicide and another not. And, and are you using the same uh, herbicide, the same pre-emergent, or is there different pre-emergents being used here? No, on a given, uh, this herbicide is called Reflex. And where you see uh, there's a green flag here, for example, that green flag from here down to the yellow flag, uh, that's one treatment uh, of this reflex herbicide. And then within that section, that's divided up into five uh, plots about 12 feet long. And at, each of those has a different variety in them. A different so, variety of watermelon. Right, right, okay, so. all right. But it's the same pre-emergent that you're applying yes, everywhere. Yes, uh -huh. And it, it's not labeled quite yet for watermelon in Oklahoma, is that correct? No, or? It, it is in some states, okay. I think in Missouri and North Carolina. Uh, again, the, the paperwork is being processed to get it approved for Oklahoma. Fantastic. So. Well, I know this will really help the watermelon growers, and thank you for sharing yeah. your research with us. My pleasure. We hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.